As Gestalt processors enter the realm of grammar, we have to realize where they've come from. Now that might sound absolutely intuitive and not at all like new information, but you think about the contrast to analytic processors when they begin grammar. When they begin grammar, they're, you know, two, two and a half, three, maybe four years old, but where they had been was at the one word stage. And when they started little bits of grammar, their credibility increased tremendously and people saw them for the first time as really having something to say. So grammar was good. It gave them extra power. For Gestalt processors, they don't know what kind of power it will give them because they've come from a place where Gestalt's worked and they've tried them out and maybe they haven't worked as well, but they don't think to themselves, oh, I must learn grammar in order to make the impact that Robin Williams did as he came out of the lantern. It just seems like we need to add more drama to make this gestalt work. So there's nothing that says to a gestalt processor, oh, I must go back and learn the basics of how sentences fit together. Not until stage three does that become apparent. And from my experience, it really does become apparent. It's like a light bulb goes off. And as Alex has said, it's a magic stage. It's where it all comes together. I mean, Ann Peters said that, Barry Prezant said that. We all see that when the children in front of us get to that magic stage three. But before that, when children are at stage one or even stage two, the idea of the single word is really antithetical. So kids have to go through this process of stage one and stage two. They have to get to stage three before the idea of building their own utterances makes any sense whatsoever. But it's natural and I would say to a person, I've witnessed the light bulb moment when the single word emerges and it emerges as a building block. So let's now compare the uh, chicken and egg way of going about language development and with the one way analytic processors get that great power when they start to develop grammar. Gestalt language processors are considerably older for the most part before they start that process and their, their thinking is pretty confused because you really want to sound like the genie. That's who you want to sound like. You want to sound like Hercules. You want to sound like Jiminy Cricket. But, you know, people are telling you, you've got to sound like, you know, Marge Blanc or Alex Sackos or any of the rest of us who introduce grammar to our kids. So, as we've said many times before in the various webinars and courses, you really do need to support your clients, your students, your children at stage three. It just sounds odd. It feels somehow natural, but it sounds odd. So it's up to us to provide the really embracing environment that allows kids to do this stage well. But I'd say it's really universal. As long as we do our jobs, and support our kids the way we need to. 
So as we have said several times and in several ways, this magic stage three is the place where the chicken and the egg come together and the pared down language from mitigations becomes the single words that then morph into the combinations that are the same as the two word combinations of analytic processors, the mommy sock. And just to revisit how kids get there, let's look again at Zoe's language samples that went with her Lego movie. We'll show the Lego movie again so you can hear how she did it. But as I've said, this is so universal that the aha moment when single words are resonant is essentially palpable to an observer. So you look at where Zoe isolated the word block. And then as Marge and Jesse play with block plus another word, Zoe says, this piece get, isolating those words. So then looking at the next slide, she does the same thing with the kind of fence that she's trying to construct. And she's kind of like on her own mission there. So we, Jesse and I, are really kind of holding a place for her. And so she isolates three wood. Now you can see her last utterance kind of reverts back, if you will, to the very polite stage one, I can help you. But the importance of these stage three comments is what we want to focus on here. And you can listen again on the video. Our next little one is Jez, who comes from a, a bilingual household um, like James, but it's Spanish and English. And his SLP, Michelle, has gotten to know him so well that his language development process has been just a part and you'll see in these amazing videos, but just a part of his emergence as a 10-year-old boy who didn't really talk outside of his home environment since he was in school. So basically for six years, he's not. And now he's telling people about his amazing SLP. You will very much enjoy this. When I started therapy with Jezreel a little over a year ago, his primary goal that I inherited was aimed at increasing his MLU to five to six words in length. I put him in a therapy group with students his age where we did contextualized language therapy activities, and he'd always sit at the table with his head looking down, playing with his Play-Doh or a Lego toy that he brought as a fidget in his lap. I decided to start seeing him one-on-one -on -one and do story reenactment type activities with him. I spent hours after work one day cutting out little construction paper representations of this fall fair from our book and making stick puppet characters for our reenactment. I was so excited to show him, but he was not. I was still not getting the engagement that I was hoping to get when I led the play and encouraged him to interact and join me. It wasn't until I went off my prepared script and did something unexpected that I saw a spark of interest from him. I made my puppet fall off the table and scream playfully, Oh no, help me! Jez turned and looked at me for the first time and said, I'll save you. I knew at that moment I had to rethink the type of therapy I was doing with Jez. I remembered a presentation on natural language acquisition that I'd gone to at a convention a few years back when I had another student who scripted quite a lot. And I decided to look back over my notes and ended up purchasing the book by Marge Blanc. To prepare for Jez's meeting this year, I compiled a list of resources and I also created an informational sheet that I could attach to the IEP 
That way the team or anybody working with Jez could reference that and be on the same page about what his language learning style is and the type of therapy that's working best for him. I started out by talking about what echolalia is and that it has meaning and it is communicative. I then started to explain what mitigation meant, what that concept means, and also what our job is in supporting these type of language learners to help them break down those gestalts and recombine things in different ways. Then I talked a little bit about what therapy has looked like so far with Jezreel, um, what has worked and what hasn't, and some ways that other people on the team could start to do similar things to what I'm doing in therapy with their own services with him. I tried to break this down into two ways they could do this. Uh, the first way being that they could take results from his own language and mitigate them and model those mitigations back for him. And I put some examples of common results that I hear him say. Then I talked about how we could pick one of those results and, as an example, unbundle it. Um, and I showed them a breakdown of how you could do that and then mix and match those mitigations in other ways. Then I started explaining the other thing that they could do during therapy with him um, is modeling useful gestalts that are not already in his inventory and then how to choose gestalts to model for him. I followed that with some examples of how to do that because I know I'm a person who likes examples and I need to see or hear a few examples before it really sinks in for me. And then I tried to explain how it might feel a little weird to try to steer away from pronouns like you um, and that we want to really try to speak as if we're speaking for Jez so that he internalizes those things and, and has things he can say from his perspective. And then I provided a summary of what the key takeaways are that I wanted them to get from this uh, presentation. I also really wanted to reiterate that asking lots of questions is not going to be helpful for these types of learners, and things you can do instead are things like narrating, think alouds, and really following his lead. Hello, my name is Irini Rilakis. I'm a former student of Dr. Lillian Stigler. I graduated from Southeastern Louisiana University in 2019. I currently work at a charter school in New Orleans, working largely with students with complex communication needs. I learned about Gestalt language processing in two of Dr. Stigler's courses, one on infants and toddlers and the other on her course on autism. I was fascinated and continue to be fascinated by delayed echolalia in Gestalt language processing and its clinical implications. I did an independent study on this topic and got to dive into the work of Ann Peters, Barry Prezant, and of course, the clinical research of Marge Blanc. It was a fabulous experience and the independent study in the end was so critical to my work with Gestalt language processors. I had one client in particular whose language samples matched so closely with what Prezant and Blanc described in Gestalt language processing. So my clients got the benefits of the NLA approach when I was in grad school, and I also got a head start on my clinical work post-graduation. I also think it was the perfect time to learn about natural language acquisition because it felt so natural and not like I was learning anything particularly new. In school, you're learning how to model language, and with NLA, you are modeling, just modeling particular grammatical structures. It all fit in together pretty seamlessly and clinically it was so relevant. For that, I have so much gratitude for my professor, Dr. Stigler, for teaching us about this topic. <laughs>